Welcome to Case Q&A, a deeper dive into the popular True Crime Arizona podcast. Our focus this episode, Robert Fisher, dead or alive? His family found murdered after an explosion of their Scottsdale home. I'm your host, Chris Pickle, joining you for a discussion with the journalists behind the True Crime Arizona podcast, reporter Brianna Whitney and producer Sergio Hernandez. And there is a reason that you guys are discussing this case now. So we actually did this investigation a little while ago, but believe it or not, it's been 20 years, 20 years. 20 years this month. Yeah, since this happened. It was April of 2001. And even without the anniversary, this case has so much attention, Mm -hmm. really worldwide. I would say before we did it, so many people asked us to do this case and to this day still our most popular podcast episode uh, and one of our most popular tv episodes too and so 20 years after the murder robert fisher remains one of the fbi's 10 most wanted people as you said around the world they know this case and it's basically because of the sheer brutality what robert fisher is accused of doing to his family so let's start with you guys Walk us through this crime. So this happens in April of 2001. The Fisher family was a family of four. Robert was married to Mary, and they had two kids, 12-year-old Brittany and 10-year-old Bobby. A well-known family in Scottsdale, went to church, did Girl Scouts, were involved in the community. Uh, A lot of people knew them out and about, social. Really no major red flags that stood out to anybody, but... In April of 2001, it was about 8.30 in the morning, and the, their house quite literally goes up in flames in a, a large explosion, not just a small house fire. I mean, the whole thing blew up, and immediately you got 911 call after 911 call. Oh, my gosh, this house is on fire. This house just exploded. I think there's people inside. So Scottsdale Fire and Scottsdale Police get to the scene, and they start to put out the fire and they they do get it out but i mean this house is pretty much destroyed but it didn't burn all the way through to where investigators couldn't see what happened inside scottsdale police starts investigating they find there's three bodies inside the house one in the master bedroom and then two bodies in each of the kids rooms and oddly enough from the start the investigators talk about was weird you know they're in their beds looking like they were sleeping when this happened and normally when you have a house fire people are trying to get out so they're generally found trying to you know get out the door to to escape so this already looked odd but when investigators actually went into these bedrooms they first saw mary who was in the master bedroom she had her throat slit and a gunshot wound to the back of her head and even more horrible uh the kids both had their throats slit but so much so that they were nearly decapitated and blood was still on their bed sheets so immediately scottsdale police says this has to be a murder i mean there something happened here and it's at that point that they're like well where's robert and that's still the question now The explosion, is the theory behind it that it was to hide the crime or was it an additional act of aggression against his family? I would actually say there's three different things. It was also a a getaway mechanism for him. Distraction? Yeah, distraction. Let's point out, you've been in the news here for years. You were in news at that time. Yeah, I was just barely starting in the industry uh, only a couple years in, but um, I remember when that call came out, we always react the same way to the house fires. We want to get to them. It's it's something, I don't know if you call, want to call it primal. People love seeing house fires. Um, but as the information started coming out about this one, it just snowballed into a bigger story as the day went on, as the week went on, as the months went on, as we found out more information from Scottsdale PD. It was, it was really, it was amazing to see all the reactions from the media and everybody around the world just like, I got to find out more about this case. And it was unfolding because at first it seemed like a house explosion. Um, well, to tell what, you the truth, it actually started as, okay. as a house fire. House fire, and then out, they figured then out. Then they that, figure out, okay, then you start getting the calls and you start confirming, yeah, it, there was an explosion. 
and then you get information from PD. I don't remember exact dates, if, if it was days later or, or later on that day. Then you start getting information from uh, PIOs that there were bodies in it. And then you go from bodies to, okay, there's supposed to be four bodies, but there's only three. And with the explosion, uh, investigators determined the actual cause. Yeah, so they were able to tell, at least with what was intact from the house, that they believe Robert Fisher cut a gas line and then lit a candle in the hallway. So eventually that gas that was pouring out would react with the candle, and that's what would set the house off into flames and explode. But he knew, Robert knew, that would take some time, mm -hmm. which is why Sergio was saying it was probably used as a get a getaway right. mechanism because he knew if he killed his family and no one heard it until this house would go into flames, he would have a solid amount of time, probably 10 hours in there to leave. And you talked to one of the original investigators on this case, TJ uh, Duran. He's the retired Scottsdale police officer. This explosion was so massive that he actually saw the bodies as he was walking around the house, correct? That's correct. Mm -hmm. and, and TJ was a real interesting person to interview. I know Sergio and I really I found him fascinating. We interviewed him in, in this like library inside his home. And he was just, I mean, he had books and books on true crime and cases. And this is a passion of his even long after his time with Scottsdale PD. And, and this is one of his most memorable cases. So retired and he still cannot let this one go. Absolutely. One of the things you were talking about how the children were killed. So shooting someone is one thing. Using a knife on something on someone is completely different. It is so much more personal. He had to be holding the kids. He was touching his own children as he was murdering him. Do you think this is one of the things that really resonates with people is just how vicious do you have to be to do this? Yeah. I. What was the line TJ used that? Um, you know what? Actually, I pulled it just because I was like, I, I love the way TJ put it. I've said it before and I truly believe it that when you're a child and you don't want to sleep with the light off because you're afraid of the boogeyman for his kids he was the boogeyman. I mean it, it's it's really that's a great way to put it because as a child you're afraid of everything in the dark and he was the man that came in and did these I mean hopefully very quick but horrible horrible things to his kids like you said that I mean how you described it was exactly right. Yeah. He had to hold his kids down cut their throats, and like Brianna mentioned, to the point to where he almost decapitated them. The person you're supposed to trust the most in the world, your and own father, nobody, is the one who takes your life. Yeah, exactly. no one understands why the kids were involved in this. So that is where we want to move on to next. Exactly. The question becomes, what could motivate someone to do something so horrific? And Lori Greenbeck and her husband, they were friends of the Fishers. You talk to them extensively in your podcast. And Lori really kind of gives us a look at the family dynamics. Yeah, Lori was great. Uh, real genuine. And I mean, just truly, you know, a mom to her daughter at the time. She worked with Mary. Their daughters were friends. I mean, she was a great person to interview just to get an idea of the Fisher family dynamic. And while she didn't not like Robert, she said right off the bat, oh, yeah, he was controlling. And she doesn't come off as all that fond of him. Uh, no. Yeah. There definitely was something there where she was, I think she made the comment, well, he's not my husband. Yeah, she so doesn't have to like him. I don't have to like him. But she loved Mary. So they'd hang She tolerated out. him. Yeah. And didn't really like the way that he treated her friend. Yeah. It, 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 she wife. would describe it as, you know, Robert had to approve everything they did. Mary couldn't have the final say, hey, yeah, you know, Brittany, Bobby, you guys can go to that. It had to come from Robert. And there also were rumors and rumblings that both Robert and Mary were unhappy that there were affairs from both of them, that Mary was possibly looking for a divorce. And that could have played a role. But even still, you could say, all right, well, there's a possible motive for killing Mary, though horrible. Still, 
Why the kids? And investigators found that Robert would often talk about his parents' divorce. Yeah, so we interviewed T.J. Duran, the former detective, and then we also interviewed John Heinzelman, who's the current Scottsdale police detective on the case. And I asked this question to John. What, do you have any idea, any inkling as to why he would take their lives in the way he did? Apparently, right, Robert would talk about his own parents' divorce and how it was bitter and how he would say, well, my kids are never going to be a product of divorce and I would never put them through that. And so John said one possible motive might have been that he killed the kids as a, a mercy killing. Like, I don't want you to go through a separation or a divorce, so I'm just going to what a sick, take you out sick of it. Sick train of thought. Awful. Oh, yeah. And one thing that did not make it into the podcast, but you guys actually went out and talked to neighbors. What were you hoping to get from that? Um, well, it was interesting just walking up to the house because I, I hadn't seen the house except for pictures of when it exploded. So I, when I went there, I was like, oh, look at the house is rebuilt. It looks nicer than the other house. It's the only one that's different in the cul-de-sac. Yeah. And so we are started knocking on doors and trying to talk to neighbors. And the one gentleman that we did talk to, um, a couple houses down, he he referenced Robert Fisher as a nice guy. It, it's, it's hard because everybody kind of referenced him, ref, referenced Robert Fisher as a nice guy. Well, you don't then, show your dark side to the world. You present your best face, what you want other people to see. Yeah, but everybody kind of said the same thing. There was something off. Okay. There was always something off, whether it was his presence around people or the way he interacted with his wife but everybody said the same thing that that we talked to that knew him something strange just i can't pinpoint a it. feeling or his actions but they could I, they elaborate i think a little bit of both and nobody could really elaborate besides saying he seemed a little uh overbearing yeah yeah i mean it all goes into that controlling kind of mindset what i found interesting was when we went to the cul-de-sac not only to get video of the house but our goal when we were knocking on the doors was to see if anybody would talk to us and sit down for an interview. A lot of the neighbors that lived there were there when Robert, you know, did this. But weirdly enough, I mean, it's been so many years, but a lot of them were still scared of him, almost scared that he could come back or that if he saw this report that they sat down and did an interview in, that he could retaliate against them. 20 years, years later, yes. there's still this fear of retaliation. Did you knock on the door where this happened? What did the people who live there, did they talk to you? We did knock on the door, but nobody was home. Nobody was home. So you went and you got this kind of idea of the family, of their dynamics, of their Robert's personality. But you guys have also watched a lot of home videos. How did you get those home videos and what do they reveal? Um, so Scottsdale PD gave us, uh, I believe it was two DVDs full of home videos. And it's eerie. It really is eerie to watch him um, because you see him interacting with his family. I'm sure it's because hindsight's 2020. I'm, I was over analyzing every little movement he made, every interaction he had with any person within the video and most of them were home videos of of uh family get-togethers birthdays uh, holidays stuff like that and that would have been when he's supposed to be having fun and interacting with his family yeah he was didn't what? seem like a uh a fun guy he, yeah he didn't seem like a fun guy no. <laughs> oh. he, he, he i feel like looking at those and and it's hard to tell because we know what happened i think yeah. if we were watching these and and we didn't know about the crime maybe we wouldn't have seen this but i i noticed he just looked so serious always Yes, most always. of the time, and especially if Mary had the video camera, like he didn't, he didn't want to be on camera, but he wanted to be in control of what was being shown on the video camera. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's one of the funny things I thought, um, I believe there was a scene where he was playing with kids in a pool, and his facial expressions stuck out to me only because, like Brandon said, he was playing with these kids and messing around, but there wasn't any. Um, Joy. smiling or happiness or joy yeah. in his face but yeah. he was still it looked like he was having fun and he was making it sounds like he was having fun and kind of giggling or laughing whatever but in his face it didn't look like it changed a lot he looked very just one-dimensional i guess you would say so the big question is where is he so let's go move from um motivation to transitioning into the actual investigation and the theories what happened to robert fisher where where is he now by all accounts, Robert Fisher, avid 
outdoorsman. So that's always featured heavily into this investigation. After the murders, there was a massive manhunt near Young, Arizona, southeast of Payson. That's about a three-hour drive from central Arizona. It's in the Tonto National Forest. So what had investigators focusing on that area around Young, Arizona? The car. So when they are searching for Robert, right, they, I mean, take us right back to the the house fire. They're looking for Robert from the start. He was supposed to be working at the Mayo Clinic that day. He didn't show up for work. None of his coworkers knew where he was. So the, the mad dash was on. The only footage they had of Robert was that the night before the explosion, he had taken out $280 at the ATM down the street, and the surveillance camera showed him in a hat and driving Mary's forerunner. So they knew he was in Mary's car, but where he went from the ATM, they didn't know until several days later when they found that forerunner in Young, Arizona, in the woods. His dog, Blue, was standing outside the car alive, but Robert wasn't there. And so immediately the investigation shifted to, we got to search these woods these were woods and, and a camping area that Robert was very familiar with. He had gone quadding there. He had gone camping, often solo. So he knew where he was going. Uh, and that's where the search kind of started going into caves and, and areas along there and near that car where it was found to try to find him. Tips started pouring in where couples had seen him walking on a road out. Uh, a tow truck driver thought he had helped pull him out of a ditch because it was a single man with a dog. So at this point, Scottsdale PD and the FBI are taking in all these tips, trying to, to figure it out while also doing boots on the ground searches, and they still couldn't find him. One thing I want to point out, which is it disturbs me. Blue, as you said, Robert's dog was found abandoned by the car. But you think about that. This man murdered his family but saved his dog from the explosion. Yeah. yeah. It's just mind-boggling on that. Uh, was, the, was the theory that Robert Fisher was almost a, an outdoorsman but to the point of being a survivalist where he could survive out in the wilderness and nobody would ever find him out there? So that's where I start to stray in terms of thinking he's this uh, this survivalist. There's a difference between somebody that's an outdoorsman, yes. goes on weekend camping trips, and a survivalist. Exactly. Being able to live out mm-hmm. there for, for days, for weeks, for months. I think he was an outdoorsman. I think he knew the area very well. Do I think he was a survivalist where he could live that long? No. No, I don't. Through the investigation, what's your theory on that, that he went there, maybe there was another car that he left or that he spent some time there and they didn't find him. My, my theory is that he went out there, let his dog out, and basically went for a walk. Um, there's a lot of areas around there bordering the reservation. Um, so uh, officials aren't allowed to go onto the reservation. People aren't right. allowed to hunt on the reservation. Mm-hmm. You're just not allowed to go over there. He could easily, he could have easily went and walked killed himself somewhere where they're not going to find him. Okay, so in the podcast, you guys do discuss this. So let's talk about that. The Fort Apache Reservation, very close, as you mentioned. Investigators don't go on it. It'd be trespassing. Um, Is the theory, if they were to go look at the Apache Reservation, are they looking for remains or is there any thought that he's still out there living in the wild? I think as it pertains to the reservation itself, Mm -hmm. the theory is they'd be looking for remains. Okay. I think if it's Robert's alive, that would be somewhere else, likely another country. Um, And and that's what made this investigation so interesting was that TJ and John don't agree on whether they think he's alive or dead. John Heiselman is the current detective who is currently working this case. It's still an open case 20 years later. Okay. John believes that Robert's dead, that he committed suicide somewhere out there, whether that was on the reservation grounds or somewhere around that area in the woods. He believes he just wasn't enough of what you would call a survivalist to be able to continue living on. And remember, he only took out $280 too, so that won't get you that far. And TJ, on the other hand, because of this tip he had gotten where this couple says he, they saw him walking out towards the highway, TJ believes he's still alive. He thinks he's savvy enough to have basically 
re-identified himself and started over a new life somewhere completely different. I will say when we went out there. And we did go, yeah, like right to where the, the car was found. We took a compass and everything with the coordinates. Yeah, me, Brianna, and another photographer were shooting uh, shots. Um, my news vehicle coming in off on that same road. And I actually thought about this after the fact is I'm looking around as I'm driving to get this shot. I'm actually in the car and uh, uh, Lou Tator, one of our photographers, is shooting the car while I'm driving. I, even if I saw someone coming down the road, um, as I'm going up to him, as I'm driving up to him closer and closer, I don't think I could have that great of, the, of a description of them. I wouldn't be able to see them and be like, oh, yeah, that's definitely that guy. You know, especially because when you look at Robert Fisher um, in some of the videos, the home videos, he, he's not striking he's not uh, you know there's nothing that really he doesn't have any crazy identifying features yeah. right so discussing maybe his remains might be on the reservation or mm -hmm. maybe he went got away went someplace else went towards the highway and there are still tips coming in from all around the world aren't there Yes, and that Canada tip is the one. Let's talk about the Canada tip. Oh, the tip. Canada tip. <laughs> I love this tip, only because the whole thing is just crazy. So I, we didn't end up interviewing the next-door neighbor, but I did talk to him one-on-one -on, -one on the phone to confirm all this information. So uh, it was in, I believe, 2012. I think it was 2012. Canadian officials end up taking a man into custody who resembled Robert Fisher. They had gotten the tip. He looked just like him. We're going to take him in and figure this out. Now, I have never seen this technique done by law enforcement ever in my life, but I have to say this is pretty interesting. Well, the next door neighbor of Robert here in Scottsdale lived there a long time, knew him growing up. He was very familiar with Robert. Happened to be living in Washington at the time. So Canadian officials brought him from Washington up to Canada and said, all right, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna pretend like you were somebody also taken into custody and you're gonna go into the room with everybody who's you know, getting processed. And so you can get a solid look at this man and tell us if you think it's Robert Fisher or not, kind of study his body language, that kind of thing. So the neighbor agrees, goes up there. And the neighbor says, here they are in, in this room and the Robert Fisher lookalike walks in. And the neighbor describes it as, the man kind of is surveying the room, looking at what's going on, you know, as anybody might mm -hmm. do in a new place like that. And then he says, as that man's eyes meet his, that that man's facial expression changed, his eyes zeroed in on him as if he completely recognized the neighbor. It's kind of the reverse um, lineup concept. Yeah. You bring the suspect yes. in <laughs> and like see who he identifies. Like, oh yeah. no, my cover is blown. Oh no. <laughs> but he was saying this was not him. Yeah, so so the, na the neighbor is like, oh, that without a doubt yep. is Robert Fisher. Still to this day, he believes that was his neighbor. But yes, it, so the reason why this guy was let go was because even though he had the, the matching back right. scar from the surgery in the military and he also had a missing tooth where Robert had had a missing tooth, all of those features were there, but his fingerprints did not match Robert Fisher's fingerprints. And let's point out with fingerprints, um, basically you can change fingerprints, but it's painful, the prints would be mutilated. They can be burned off They with acid or heat. They can be worn down. The pads can actually be cut off and sewn together. Uh, it's something, you know, it, mafia tries to do this every once in a while, but there's always evidence of it. You can't just change your fingerprints with no evidence. And you'd also, even if you did change them, they'd still be your own unique identification of fingerprints these ones matched this other man's yes. identity so that's why police say no that absolutely wasn't him but i do find it interesting that the neighbor still even despite that says no that was absolutely my neighbor that i grew up with for years that was robert fisher have they been getting in more tips have investigators been getting more tips on this case still today yes uh so we sat down for a uh, this interview a little while ago, actually, and I've been in contact with the investigators since our interview. And not only are tips still pouring in, but there there is one in particular that they are investigating that's fairly credible here in Arizona. 
Um, there's some information that Robert Fisher may be buried on a ranch in Northeast Arizona, but that's not confirmed. It's something they're looking into. Uh, and it's kind of tips through word of mouth that have come through several different people, but they're working on narrowing down what location that truly could be to be able to go out there and, and do a search. Okay, so that would be a question. If they have the information, they just don't have a specific location? Right. Who would have buried him? That's a great question. I have no idea. From what I gathered, the tips were sometimes pretty vague. Hey, this is what I heard. And then obviously they start to investigate and say, okay, is it re even worth our time? Can we make a couple mm -hmm. phone calls out of this? And, and, and that will solve this. Uh, right. And let's point out on a tip like that, they're not just going to grab a shovel and go no. out because they're, you, I, it's, it is very intricate when you're uncovering uh, evidence because you don't want to disturb evidence. So it's not just let's head out and just, it's, it's yeah. also resources. They can't go right. to extremes on every single tip. No. And, and even, even on our investigations that we have on social media and stuff, I have people that say, I swear I saw him in 2005 in Nebraska. I swear I saw him at this gas station in 2011 in Louisiana. I mean, right. You can't, And you want that information because you, you want it to be mm -hmm. looked into but not everyone is credible. Right. And so this could fall just in the same category as those. I mean, John said they do look at all of the tips. They do receive them all and they do look at them. Um, but this one I think is of bigger interest because it is in Arizona and it is in Northeast Arizona, which is close to where the car was found. I'll say one of the most disturbing warnings that I've heard in a long time came from the detective that was it from tj or john who really just says everyone out there take TJ. a look at the person okay so that was tj he was the original um investigator on the one who thinks he's still yes. alive and the warning is take a look around you to me it is it's disturbing because yes. it really raises the question what do you know about people you care about, about people you know, because with all the neighbors, mm -hmm. nobody would have thought he was, even thinking he was off, nobody would have thought, yeah, he'd kill his no. family like this. So he's asking for help to still identify, to find Robert. What is the warning? And what did you think when he was saying this to you? No, you're absolutely right. This, the warning was disturbing. You know, I mean, you you meet people in your lives, you date people, and you you know you you bring them into your lives, whether you're living together or something. And his warning was about if you're sitting next to your significant other, um, and you look at him and you recognize him as Robert Fisher, um, what do you do? Well, you would probably call and say, "Hey, this is you know him." What would his reaction be? He brutally murdered his wife and his two children. Um, and then, like TJ says, and the, the FU shot was he shot his wife after he cut her throat. What would he do to you not to get caught? Someone that he didn't, um, uh, somebody that he's not a parent of or a wife or a husband of. I that we know of. I mean, he could have had more kids. God, we just don't know. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah you can throw that in there, too. Yeah, <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> there, uh this is still an active investigation and there's a reward, correct? Yeah. Uh, there's lots of money there because he's on the top 10 mm -hmm. uh, FBI's most wanted list. And I think the point you made about, you know, what do you really know about somebody is something that Lori Greenback really struggled with. She was so genuine in her interview. And, you know, she one one part that I thought was so interesting was that the weekend before this had happened, her husband had gone quadding with Robert, and it ended up being exactly where the car was found. So she thinks now in hindsight, he was planning his getaway mm -hmm. while just taking her husband on a trip. He had no idea. And so Lori, you know, really was reflecting on the fact that she questioned herself so much after this, because how do you trust somebody to be your friend, to let your daughter spend the night at the Fisher's house and know that he was capable of this? I mean, she's like, I had to go through my own kind of personal journey of who, who am I and, and am I a good judgment of people? And I think that that's something that so many struggled with in this case because 
there's one thing to be controlling and have maybe some bumps in your marriage or relationship. That's fairly normal. To then go from that to I'm going to annihilate my entire family, that's absolutely not normal. Right. And no one could see that coming. And so I think for the, the friends of the Fishers and, and family, it was like, how do you even know somebody? Maybe you don't. Final thoughts on this case? Well, After digging deeper? So Sergio, yeah, you... You were kind of talking about it earlier, but I, we've always wanted to tell people because the one question the two of us get all the time is, well, do you guys think he's dead or alive? You know, this investigator says dead. This investigator says alive. What do you think? Sergio, you were kind of just talking about it, but you can go first. I do think he is dead. I will put a caveat in that because the Canada story is really interesting. So, yeah. Although I do think he's dead. When you hear the whole story and everything laid out. You it, think it's the Canada guy? No, 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 no. Oh, I think okay. he's dead. Okay. But I, but the Canada story definitely makes me, gives me a little pause. And I'm like, hmm, you know, is he that smart to get away and get up there and live this long? But I still think he's dead. And that is a good point. The tips that come in are from all over. A lot of them are from Canada, but also Mexico, Guatemala. And they've had a lot of them. So he could be anywhere. I also think that Robert is dead. Um, I don't think he was enough of a, of a survivalist to be able to just live off the land and nobody catch him there. I also think you can't live off of $280. I mean, maybe for a little while, but this long. And just the way technology has changed too. I mean, you also have to think this was April of 2001. So that same year is when 9-11 happened. And I think security and cameras and things like that have ramped up so much since then. I mean... You've got social media, you've got surveillance cameras, you've got ring doorbell cameras. There's so many ways to track people and find them nowadays. I just don't think he could still be living and not get caught. But like Sergio says, just based, I mean, the investigators tell us, you know, they're literally every possible theory could be matched to evidence that they do know in the case. I, it really could go mm -hmm. any way, but I do think he's dead as well. Yeah. I'll just play devil's advocate on it. He could be getting caught on a ring doorbell every day and we wouldn't know it's him if you don't know how much pre premeditation there was with this. If he was out scouting these campgrounds, um, it, this was a premeditated murder. Did he have, did he take out the money and to make people think, I only have $280. Maybe he had other resources that no one knows about at this point. It's an open case. It's an active case. And that is the burning question. Where is Robert Fisher? On behalf of Brianna, Sergio, and myself, thank you for joining us for this episode of Case Q&A, a discussion of the True Crime Arizona podcast. <laughs>